Have you ever wondered what life is with or without Jesus? Why not? Would you in the following feed? So the first 10 verses of chapter 2, Paul is going to elaborate to you and I. What exactly does this statement mean? Him who feels all in all. How many like to watch the movie or the program on TV called Extreme Makeover? These 10 verses a spiritual extreme makeover. So, ready? The way I do this and I process this is very simple. These 10 verses of chapter 2 can be summarized in one sentence. Life with or without Jesus. Life with all without Jesus. And it's very interesting. He's going to begin by telling us life without Jesus. Without Jesus. Okay? So he begins in verse 1. And you, now he's addressing you and I, the modern day Ephesians, were dead in your trespasses and sin. Right? From the get go, he's telling you and I, number one, life without Jesus means spiritually dead. Is that not true? In the case of our personal life, before we became Christian, we were spiritually dead. We had no idea the difference between right from wrong, evil from good, godliness from worldliness, lust from law, right? Is that not true? We all yes. can confess to that truth, right? And then Paul gives us the reason, the cause of this spiritual death. Two important words right here. Trespasses and sins. Does anybody know the difference between trespasses and sins? One willing and one where you're sinning without. So which one is willing sin? Willing is sin. Trespasses. I shouldn't say unwilling, but. You're just not educated enough to know you're hurting God. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Stephen. <laughs> how about pre how about premeditated? Is a good word. We think. Though. Yeah, better, Stevie. Okay. <laughs> so this is where the original Greek word becomes helpful to you and I, right? I sent out the note. I hope everybody gets the note. So if you do, just move along with it. So to speak, trespasses, part of Toma. Paraptoma, that's the Greek word. It's a deviation from a straight and narrow path. And for you to deviate, like Stephen right now, he's driving on I-95, right? It's a straight shot, so to speak. It's a straight line. But if he decides <laughs> through the exercise of his will to deviate, guess what's going to happen to him? Yeah. Accident, perhaps even <laughs> fatal at that right so the idea behind this word trespasses part of toma bill is willful intentional sin as a matter of fact this word trespasses is a legal word that means you willfully voluntarily intentionally cross ah. over cross over a boundary remember we have this sign no trespassing right so if you ever see this sign that it says no trespassing, what that means is if you do, you did it to yourself. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, okay. yeah. If you're trespassing, you yeah. know you're walking yeah. in somebody else's back not yard, not yours. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great analogy. Great analogy. Yeah. That you know you should have not done. Right. So the Catholic Church, we owe it to the Catholic Church by coming up with this phraseology called sins of commission. <clears throat> sins of commission. So you intentionally, voluntarily, willfully commit these sins despite the fact that you know you shouldn't be. So Paul says the first cause of our being spiritually dead before we become a Christian, before we make Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior, is this willful, intentional, voluntary tendency to trespass. The law of God at that. Right? So he gives us a second reason. Sins. Hamartia. Hamartia means it's an archery terminology. What that means is you shoot your arrow, but you miss the mark. 
And because you miss the mark, you're not getting the prize. So this, according to the Catholic Church again, we owe it to the Catholic Church. It's called sins of omission. So let's say Stephen is driving. He saw a stall car. He knew deep down inside he should stop and help, be the good Samaritan, right? But if he didn't do that, <laughs> what kind of sin he would have committed? I'll trust that. Missing a mark. Trespassing. Trespass. Trespassing if you need. Trespasses. Yeah. Because trespass. your, your conscience already told you, stop. Yeah. Be the good Samaritan. But, but, but it happened twice. And it was after the fact and it was on the highway. I think it was more of an omission. <laughs> <laughs> the sin of omission simply is, uh, as the uh, terminology itself, uh, pretty much self-explanatory, right? You shoot your arrow, but you miss the mark. And as a result, you're not getting the prize if you would have hit the mark. So Paul is telling us right here, two causes of you and I before we become Christian, being spiritually dead is this tendency to trespass and to miss the mark, the mark that God has set for you and I. And it gets worse in verse 2, in which you formally walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. This is jam-packed with theology. So the second reason Paul tells you and I that we're spiritually dead is because we were walking according to three things in verse 2. Number one, according to the course of this world. The word course right there in the Greek. I -E -on. It means age. It means age, not chronological age, naturally, right? Timeline, a period of chronology, so to speak. So the first uh, reason, Paul says, that we were walking according to the timeline of this world. And the word world, cosmos, right there, it means orderly arrangement. Orderly arrangement, man-made at that, not God-originated. Anything and everything from this world, arrangement at that, orderly though it is, but it is man-made, but not God-originated. And the second reason, he said, we were walking according to the prince of the power of the air, none other than Satan himself, right? So that's the second reason. The third one, is the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. So the prince of the power of the air equals the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience who sets up for you and I before we become Christian, the course of this world that we easily fell victim to. That's huge. That's a revelation for you and I. Now that we become a Christian, we must do anything and everything we can to avoid walking in the course of this world. Notice how the world always pulls you and I away from God. Lures you, tempts you, attracts you, distracts you, traps you. You fill in the blank. Why? Because who is in control, according to Paul in verse 2? The prince of the power of the air. The word prince, right there, we talked about this before. Archon, archon, right? First in rank. So we know before he became what we call him to be Satan, he was first in rank among the angels in charge of all other worshiping angels. That's the idea of this word prince right here. Right, power of course, exousia that's delegated authority, which is a good thing. What that means is the power that he had has been delegated to him by who? By God, God, when he was the good angel before he became the bad angel that we call him today to be Lucifer, Satan, adversary. So, guess who is in control of that power? God. God, glory to God, right? Yeah. Nothing to fear right here. It's a very simple theology. If God delegated the authority and power to him, he can only do to you and I what God allows him to. The book of Job tells us that. 
Mm. Okay? That's why I always say there's a bunch of mumbo jumbo spiritual warfare teachings out there. Either on the pulpit or on the internet. Biblical spiritual warfare simply defined is this. Just live out your identity as a Christian. Don't yeah. worry about binding Satan, Andre. <laughs> because God allows them here for a reason. And I was wondering what you think, why, why he is here. Yeah, the Jewish, look, the Jewish people, in the Jewish mind, they look at Satan as a secret agent from God. God allow him to be and to do what he so pleases to accomplish God's purpose. That's the whole idea with this phrase, secret agent. So sometimes if we're not careful, we get, get, get caught up and consumed in Satan. Right? C.S. Lewis, if you, if you ever heard of this fellow, British apologist C.S. Lewis, he basically said when it comes to Satan, you don't want to put too much emphasis on him, neither do you want to ignore him completely. Balance. Mm -hmm. Balance is the key. Right? We as Christians, we're supposed to focus on Jesus. Bill. I love that, that you just said that. I know so many people I fellowship with who are either not consumed there's no happy medium. It's either look out for Satan or Satan doesn't exist. You know, I think all of us are looking for that balance and we need to know that balance and be reminded of it on a daily basis, you know? And um, I don't mean to go on a rabbit trail with this, but with Chris, I, I watched a movie and I wanted to consult him and it was about a man that was possessed, but it actually had a an eye opening it, it, it opened my eyes to, to the tricks of satan and i thought it was i didn't want to i don't know how to say it i didn't want to blaspheme god in any way by watching it and i'm very careful at what i take in my mind because i know it, it it what dictates what comes out of my mouth but it's hard to explain but i was very very glad i watched it uh, in the end of the movie. And um, I don't know. I just think we should all, you know, it's like Chris said, we should all know our enemies. If we're a football team, we want to know our other team's plays. You know, uh, am I off on that or? No, no, no. we should no. know our enemy. That's that's very important, right? You cannot win against an enemy that you know nothing of. But at the same time, there's a big difference between knowing your enemy and being caught up and consumed with your enemy. Right. Right? And, and it, what if I were to tell you, in a Jewish mind, Satan is sort of symbolic of this Yetzer Hara, they call it Yetzer Hara. It basically means evil inclination that every one of us here was born with. For that reason, in the Jewish mind, Satan is a secret agent from God. Now, that's worth a few teachings right there, folks. But is this not true? Every one of us was born with this evil inclination, Frank. So, Paul, after we become Christian and we still sin, which we all do, uh, I have a tendency to you know, want to blame it on my past or should I look at it that I'm not close enough spiritually with God or is it both? Great question. Great question. We have a narrative in the New Testament about Jesus walking on the Sea of Galilee. Peter, among the 12, alone saw Jesus. Jesus bid him to come. He started walking on water. As long as he focused on Jesus, the water was not an issue. Once he took his eyes off Jesus, the water became a problem. Oh, I like that. <laughs> Stephen? Thank you. You're welcome. Frank, Frank, that's been a question of mine probably for most of my last 20 years. How much of it is manifested by me and how much of it is manifested by me? Some of these, you know, everything, all our decisions come from the heart. So I got to get, I guess, more claim victory on 
on most of my sins and the devil made me do it. Maybe he made me do it in the first place, but all the times after it was probably all me. I, I'm a big 80 percenter guy. I'll take 80 percent of the blame. <laughs> so for that reason, Frank and Stephen and the rest of us here, this first 10 verses of chapter two are worth memorizing, meditating, because these verses tell you and I what we were before we become Christian and what we are after we become Christian. You have a choice to choose. Which one are you going to focus on before or after? Sean. Um, yeah, I read ahead. These verses are awesome. I've read them before, but I just read ahead again. And uh, it's such an awesome message. Um, I was thinking as Steve was talking, it's like uh, the sanctification uh, journey. You know what I'm saying? I, I have had, uh, you know, just it, it's like you're climbing a ladder out of this hole because I was living in a hole, you know what I mean, of sin. And, uh, you know, and it takes a little while to climb out. And uh, but I can def I definitely love what you said about about uh, the being in the water there, Peter. And uh, that was an awesome way of putting yeah. it. Just have to stay yeah. focused on Jesus well, to, overcome, to overcome whatever we haven't overcome already, you know. Yeah, you just gave us another excellent analogy with the use of a ladder, right? Two things we must keep in the back of our mind whenever we use a ladder. Number one, it must be on the solid ground, right? The bottom of the ladder. Number two, before you even start climbing the ladder, make sure you lean the ladder on the right building because you don't want to climb all the way up only to find yourself standing on the wrong building. Is that making sense? Yeah. 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 So the ground upon which we've set our ladder is Jesus Christ. The building is what Paul is telling you and I in this book, Ephesians, how to walk, how to love, how to be, how to do, some of them he elaborated in these 10 verses, right? So first well, again, so notice right here, there's a sense of humor in the great apostle Paul right here, the brilliance of his mind. I don't know if you get it or catch it. Let's read this again, right? In which you formerly walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. But then again, he said, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. That word air in the Greek, it means blow, like you would blow candles on your birthday. On the other hand, that word spirit right there is a current, a move, a movement of air. Did you not catch Paul's sense of humor right here? He gave the credit, so to speak, to Satan being the prince of the power of the air. But then he contrasts that later on when he's going to be talking about the Holy Spirit. Because the word spirit right here, small letter S, right? In the Greek is pneuma, pneuma, P-N-E-U-M-A. It's the same Greek word Paul letter would use to describe the Holy Spirit. That's the brilliance of the great apostle Paul in his writing. And sometimes it is in unpacking the Bible first by first like we're doing, word by word at that. You get into the head of the author. Yeah. You get a sense of why he wrote the way he did, Sean. But in this this uh, use of the word spirit, it's obviously a bad spirit, right? Yes, yes. So the phrase, the prince of the power of the air equals the spirit that is now working. Emphasis, now working. The idea is Paul is alerting you and I. Yes, you're a Christian. Watch out but his prince of the power of the air, who is still working in the aids of this cosmos. So, Chris? So say there's a cult, and these people willingly, knowingly want to serve the devil, Satan, and then they swear to it, they do rituals, they blood, whatever they do. Um, their soul is... They can't sell their soul. Their soul God owns. So, so they're being fooled. 
no matter what happens to them or what they do, how evil they are, they're they're just being fooled by 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 the evil spirit of Satan. Yes, yes. As a matter of fact, you could summarize verse one as death, verse two as deception. Stephen. It just reminds me of the phrase back in Genesis, sin is crouching at the door waiting. Hmm. Yeah. So Paul is saying to you and I right here, according to first one, life without Jesus Christ, put it that way, results in you and I being spiritually dead. That's first one. In first two, you are deceived. How so? By the course of this world. And the course of this world is under the dictate of the prince of the power of the air, who is none other than Satan, who is the God of this world according to Paul himself in his writing in Corinthians, right? It is the same spirit Paul is telling you and I. Notice right here the prophetic nature of this phrase. The spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. He wrote this before he was beheaded. This is 2024. The application of this verse is still relevant to you and I today. Sure. Yeah. Oh, my gosh, it's here. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I don't know. To me, like when you talk about people who are like Satan worshiper type people, I it absolutely baffles me beyond anything that because then you must, if you're willing to worship Satan, you must also believe that there's a God. Right? And you choose that. I mean, we have this building here in Albany, it was on the news, and and you know, I mean, I've heard of you know satanic cults exist existing in places and stuff but this vacant building they showed on the news where they the had big warehouse yeah, <laughs> yeah this, and they had this it turned into like a satan worship place where they had all these dummies dolls you know mannequins up with painting and lip weird lipstick and different things on their face all this stuff written on the walls and it was like unbelievable to me that that's actually what somebody would make a choice to do that you know, yeah. and, and it, it so baffles me. You know there's a God if you know there's a Satan, and you pick Satan. <laughs> Great you know? observation and commentary. Paul is going to tell us why they do the things that they do. Verse 3, among them, we too, all, formerly, live in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. So Paul now is telling you and I in verse 3, the reason these people chose voluntarily, intentionally at that, to do what they did, as exemplified by Chris with people that believe in Satan and cult of Satan, is because their minds were depraved. Yeah. Yeah, well, even, wrong, even, I'm sorry. One wrong move, that spirit of Satan can come in you, and your heart can be hardened, and and spiritual presence of God can it cannot stimulate you. You know that that that's how easy it can change from being in the spirit of God to being no stimuli from the spirit or or or, or, or anything godly. Yes, they were depraved. And Paul tells us in what way would they depraved? Just right here, two important phrases. The lusts of the flesh and the lusts of the mind. Mm. John? Even when I was a lost, empty sinner, I, I never did anything but cry out to God. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was still crying out to God, thankfully. I mean, you know? Yeah, me too, dude. You know, you know. Yeah. The depravity is such that without them realizing it, they're enslaved in their own lust of the flesh and lust of the mind. I had the opportunity a, a few times to be in that building, so we kind of followed it. A lot of what goes on in there, the depravity, is uh, is people like you guys, when you were quite in your lowest moments, they just love it there. They, a lot of what sin is of these people's life is the here and right now. Not worrying about right now. Can I be in a happy mood for this night? Even if it means dancing with all these people and writing this stuff on the wall. And let's face it, they're going deeper places that we don't even want to talk about. But it just, it's the lust. It just starts with the lust. And then once you get that far down, you can't get out of it. 
it's it's a it's a very dangerous and destructive path, right? Because the word lust right here in the Greek epitumia, it means a longing for the forbidden. A longing for the forbidden. Yeah. Wow. Bill? Yeah, I mean the only way to combat that is to not disobey God. I mean, it's the disobedience of God's word and God's will for us to live. That's, I mean, it's it's not something to fear, something to be warned of. But, I mean, I feel bad for the people who haven't experienced our Lord, and this is their first experience. But for us in our walk, it's just to obey the Lord. And the, the rest, don't give Satan a stronghold. This comes, this is a, in my opinion, this is a direct result of disobeying the will of God, sinning against God. You give Satan, you open the door for your, you know, you willfully open the door or stupidly open the door for Satan to come into your life and pull you farther away. I mean, that's what I read when I when I read these these things. It just yeah, kind of reinforces what I believe. You know, what I what I live by. What I try to live by every day. And my my question was: Was it more of a lust for the the evil or a rebellion against the good? Great question. So to answer your question and to comment what Bill was saying early on, right? This word "flesh" in the Greek "sark" s a r x has the idea of you walking, living, breathing without your skin. This is the longing for the forbidden that has so consumed and enslaved them. They're living, walking, and breathing as if without the skin. That's hard to imagine for you and I. Wow. That's just how depraved they are, according to Paul, right here in this verse. So life without Christ, you're spiritually dead, you're deceived, not only by the prince of this world, by the world itself, and then you're so depraved without you realizing it, you're walking around like a zombie, so to speak, not even realizing you don't have skin on you. That's powerful. And then yeah, Paul says right here, the loss of the mind, this word mind, dianonia, dianonia, it doesn't just mean understanding, but also imagination. So these people were imagining things that are out of this world. This is why they do the things that they do. I feel they're so depraved that that they can't help themselves. Well, I don't like the word can't, but yeah. they're so yeah. deep in it. Yes, yes. Right? Yeah, they're slaves to their depravity. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's almost like somebody who is addicted to something. They know they shouldn't do it again, but they cannot help but to do it again. That's a, that's a great explanation. <laughs> it is. So, it is. I don't mean to laugh, but wow. Yeah. I, am I okay now? Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, Mimi, I, I got a question there because I want to know out of, out of ignorance because Mimi's, Mimi's niece, you know, she's the one with, the, she's married to a woman, she's going through medical school, she's an amazing girl, smart, um, you know, humble, but she believes in, it's okay to be okay, it's, it's okay, but she's going through medical school and being taught a specific, I won't go deep into it, but a Rockefeller medical system, and she's going to do her best, and she's going to do her best to become the best she can be. Out of just not knowing, out of doing it a big, I don't see her as a lustful, well, you know, in a couple areas, I, I got no other choice but to say that, but she, she's a, she's a, an ignorant girl going through this, doing the best she can, but she's going to be doing something that's ultimately now in my spirit is evil. Well, it's exactly what Paul says in the prior first, the course of this world. So in that case, she is living a according to the course of this world that is set and dictated by the prince of this world who is none other than Satan himself. Can you not see now why Paul emphasizes the renewing of our mind? 
Can you not see now why Paul said we have to take captive every thought to the obedience of Christ? Now, the phrase to the obedience of Christ right there is very important because he was tempted many, many ways to not go to the cross, but he obeyed. Derek? So where is the help and the hope for these people that are so entwined with their conviction to follow Satan? And right. they think that, and they think that's the right way. How, how do you, how do you save them? Right. They don't want to be saved. Yeah. So, uh, if I never told you this before, I'm going to tell you tonight. Of all the words in the English Bible, these two words are the greatest words. But God. But God, which begins first four. Right? So let's backtrack a little bit before we change direction right here. Because beginning with verse 4, it's life with Christ. From verse 1 to verse 3, life without Christ. We are spiritually dead. We are deceived. We are depraved. We are doomed. Notice right here at the end of verse 3. By nature, children of wrath, even as the rest. Not only were we spiritually dead, not only were we deceived by Satan, the prince of this world, we were depraved because of the lust of the flesh and the lust of the mind. And we were also doomed. We've become children of wrath. So now God intervened in these two words. But God, these two words are very revealing. This, number one, it proves the existence of this biblical God. Because if, did not, if he did not exist, the great apostle Paul would have not penned it down this way. But God. At the same time, the fact that he exists, these two words tells you and I the contradiction, the contrast between the biblical God and the God of this world. The contradiction and the contrast between this biblical God and you and I. So two it's words. God. Six letters packed with theology. Chris? Those two words, but God, that means it's God's, it has to be God's initiative for, for your salvation. Exactly what he says. But God, not this, being rich in mercy, Derek, because of his great love with which he loved you and I. That's the solution to these people. That's the offer God is giving to them and to you and I. Even now, as a Christian, don't forget, even now, as a Christian, the Christian life and walk begins and ends with this powerful word that he introduced in verse 5, grace, caris, grace, caris, right? Two words, six letters, one conjunction, one personal noun, the two most important words in the Bible, the two most impacting and revealing words about this biblical God. And you and I, if we want to embrace that, I jokingly would say every now and then, there is the bad but, and there is the good but. This is the good but. <laughs> Sorry, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> usually in my life when the sentence starts with but i'm wrong <laughs> yes great commentary normally when you read an article and you come across this conjunction but uh oh something bad is right around the corner in this case something wonderful something supernatural something beyond any human mind can comprehend notice it says right here being rich in mercy because of his great love not just love great love he didn't keep this love to himself with which he loves you and i this is the genesis, these two words, is the genesis of God's plan of salvation for humanity, you and I. Two words, never miss them, pay attention. <laughs> 
right? I always emphasize the power of observation. If you just read this nonchalant, you're going to miss that. These two words, but God, are like a door hinge. Life without Christ, now it's turning to life with Christ. And what is being offered in this verse simply is this. Are you going to receive God's plan of salvation for yourself? That's Paul is saying. But if you do, he said, let me tell you what life with Christ will look like to you in the following verses. So what kind of life with Christ is he offering us? Paul, it says right here, even when we were dead in our transgression, notice he did not say, even when we were dead in our sins. Did you catch that? He said, even when we were dead in our transgression, willful, voluntary, intentional sin at that, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we will walk in them. Notice how many times we use this phrase, in Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus. Don't miss that. Life with Christ simply defined, according to Paul in these verses, is life in Christ Jesus. That's point number one. That's truth number one. So if you believe in this offer from God that begins in verse four, to receive, to embrace his offer of salvation, you are now the beneficiary of life in Christ Jesus. So what kind of life in Christ Jesus is Paul telling us? Number one, mm. it involves the rich mercy of God. The word mercy, eleos, eleos, it means compassion. Is this not why in the gospel you read this many, many times? Because of the compassion that he had. Jesus performed the miracles. Because of the compassion that he had, he healed the sick. That's the kind of compassion Paul is talking about in this word mercy right here. It involves the rich mercy of God, not just a limited kind of mercy. It's a rich beyond belief kind of mercy. Now, how many here are familiar with the difference between grace and mercy? There's a big difference between grace and mercy, right? What is grace? Uh, what we don't deserve. Undeserving love of God. Okay. Mary Alice, what is grace? I was going to say when we're given something that we don't deserve, and mercy is when we're not given something that we do deserve. Yes, these two words, the difference of them, we need yeah, to understand to the core of our being. Because if we don't, we're going to misuse and abuse either or both grace and mercy of God. Derek? Okay, so... So if God is is rich in mercy and his great love that he's just granted us, why is it so easy for the devil to sink his hooks into us? That is not yes. true, biblically. Biblically speaking, that is not true. Because as you become a Christian, God expects you and I to mature, to grow spiritually. It is when we don't, what you just said, becomes a daily reality. Paul himself said, we are not to be ignorant of the devil's scheme. How are we not to be ignorant? We gotta spend time in the truth. We gotta spend time in the word of yes. God. Yeah, yeah. Right? It is when we don't do that, we become easily victimized. Right. Look at how many times, just, just before we become Christian, for everything and anything that went wrong in our life, we say, the devil made me do it. 
No, he didn't. He didn't. That's the no. truth. That's the biblical truth. You did it yourself. Exactly. You're just not being a man enough to own it up. You're blaming on the devil. And you don't realize every time you say, ah, the devil made me do it, he's laughing himself to the bank. Imagine every time you make a statement, he had $10 in his hands. Oh, <laughs> he would have been a millionaire. <laughs> right? Look, God expects you and I to mature. Part of maturity is yeah. owning, owning up Amen. to the paratoma right. and hamartia. Mary Alice? Um, so this is a question about the word rich. And, and so it's used in verse four and it's used in seven that I see that close together. Mm -hmm. Is this, does this tie back to the anthropomorphic? Is this an example of the anthropomorphic that you were trying to Absolutely. explain? Absolutely. Even with the use of this word rich back to back twice in three verses, four verses, four, five, six, seven, we still cannot comprehend. We still have no idea of the wealth of the riches of his mercy. The only way we understand and know about it is because we are allowed to experience it. That you and I can forgive one another. That's grace. Uh, yeah. That you and I can love the unloving, unlovable, just as we once were, as God loved us, it says right here in verse 4, because of his great love with which he loved us. That we are able to love those that are under our skin. That's grace. The longing to be together when we when we can't be together. Last last Sunday. And, and, and can I tell you something about this grace of God? What is ironic about it? Have you noticed something? The longer you become a Christian, the more alienated you are from the world. Amen. I love that. <laughs> That's I've learned grace love that. in an ironic way. But it requires the exercise of our will, Brian. It just to kind of give an example of what you said, I was at work last week and I try not to get too involved in the comings and goings of the people around at work. And one of the other therapists looked at me and, you know, was like, you, you're, you're weird. You don't want to participate with us. You're weird. And I was like, <laughs> she said that, like the old me would have probably got up and stomped on her, but I was looking at her smiling going, in my head, I'm like, praise God. I, I like to be weird. You know? All right, bro. Yes, baby. <laughs> kind of, yes. You're going to find that's... out the longer yeah. you become a Christian, the smaller your world gets. My world is pretty small. <laughs> and suddenly, the road becomes the path. The difference between a road and a path. Do you know the difference between the road and the path? A path is narrow, a road is broad and wide. You don't have to look for the road. You have to search for the path. Oh, very mm. good. Oh, that was good. I like yeah, it. You passed through the revolving door. That was good. Yeah. So what kind of love, Derek, what kind of love is Paul trying to tell us right here? It's not brotherly love. It's not lustful love. It's not parents to children love, it's agape. Agape. Agape simply defined is selfless, sacrificial, serving. Selfless, he gave his son. Sacrificial, not only did he give his son for you and I, he let his son take upon his body the punishment of your sin and my sin. That's the sacrificial nature of his love. Serving, even to this day, whatever troubles you, Whatever sorrows you, whatever you suffer from, all it takes is a conversation with Jesus. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father, waiting for you to call upon him and say, Lord, help me in this situation. I don't want to forgive my neighbor, but you tell me I need to. Grace me, empower and enable me to do what I cannot do alone on my own. That's grace. 
Mariales. Can we can we pray for God's grace for other people or does it have to be self? The best way to pray for God to give other people grace if we extend that grace in a practical, concrete manner. Can you give me an example? I'm not sure I understand that. Sure. Let's say you cannot get along with a particular neighbor who is a Hindu, who is of India. You can tell him about grace theologically. You can pray to God about grace. But the moment you embrace him for who he is, without you trying to shove down his throat, your Christian theology and doctrine, beliefs, values, virtues, and practices, he experienced the grace of God through you. They will open his eyes to see, wait a minute here, all these other gods I worship cannot do for me what the God of this person does, not only for himself or herself, but to me as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Grace simply defined is God empowering, enabling us to do what we cannot do on our own. If I get mad at Sean, I'm not going to call him. I don't want to talk to him. He will be the last thing on the list for the on the people list of people I will talk to. Grace comes in and intervenes, picked up the phone, talked to him as if nothing happened. Why well, you got to pick me? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're the one that looks the meanest. <laughs> <laughs> Stupid, horrible guy. <laughs> I, I, I challenge you, folks. Here's the key. You want to grow exponentially? You want to mature spiritually exponentially? It is in the moment when the robber meets the road. It is in the heat of the moment. You let God's grace flow through you. That requires dying to ourselves. That requires yielding our will to God. That requires the proper and correct exercise of this will God has given us to choose. For Christ or against Christ? For God's glory or my glory? Right? Chris, you okay? Yeah, yeah. I'm I, I'm still stuck on but God. I'm still meditating. <laughs> I'm still meditating on, on this. Like, it's God's invitation. It's all God. It's all God. You know, this is, you know, I can say, or how could I possibly judge anyone or anything when God is, God bestowed so much on me in my life. And that but God part, you know, we're talking about the cult and everything. And I'm trying to wrap my head around that. Like, is the invitation extended to them? Or does God know already that there's no invitation to be given because they won't do it anyways? I, I, you know, I just... It's all God's initiative. It it has nothing to, you know, I must seek him. But, but did, I mean, was that, God planted that in me, you know, in those hotel rooms. I'm like, I like Billy said a little while ago, like, thank God I ran to God like a little girl, you know, like a little baby. Uh, I, you know, when we were in those bad moments. But I know people that don't. And, you know, but but that had to be God because... People don't. Had to yes. be. Had yes. to be. It's, a, <laughs> it's an irony, isn't it, right? Despite the fact that God is proactive, despite the fact that God takes the initiative, the reality of our life tells us there are still human beings who choose not to want him. But that shouldn't <sighs> cost you an eye to give up. Huh? That shouldn't cost you an eye huh? to walk away. Right? If God is proactive for your salvation, who gives you an eye the right to not be proactive for other people's salvation? Oh, Am I right? Yeah. When I was going to my fiercely contested divorce, God used a diehard Catholic friend of mine to feed me, to be my sounding board, to be with me when I was going through restlessness, anxiety, I know that bug guide can be 
but God used Derek to bring him to Christ. You know, but yeah. God yeah. used Frank to bring him to Christ. But God. Yeah. Yes. Well, whatever is the impossible situation you're going through right now, I challenge you to practice this discipline. Infuse into the situation that's seemingly impossible. But God. Yeah. Prophetically proclaim. Talk, speak into the situation. But God already know how this is going to turn out. But God is still in charge of this seemingly impossible situation. But God will hear my prayer on behalf of this person who is seemingly lost. There's always but God. Mm -hmm. Yes. Always. Yes. Stephen. He, it's, it's definitely the buck stops here. Right, right there. <laughs> that's, the top of the, that's the top of the food chain. It's, you know, it just stops me in my tracks. It's the good but, like I said, right? So what kind of great love, what kind of love, what kind of great love is Paul trying to tell you and I right here? Well, Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 3. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 3 calls and describes and identifies this love of God as eternal love. Eternal love. That means no time limit. How great is that? Jeremiah 31, verse 3. Jeremiah 31, verse 3. And then Paul himself in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. I know that uh, Brian is very well first in Romans, <laughs> right? Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Paul calls this love sacrificial love. Sacrificial love. What that means is it's not going to cost you anything. It's going to cost God everything. Think about that. Why is that grace? That's grace. And Chris, you know, in, in the Beatitudes, you know, the meekness is 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 a power. It's power. People think that you're weak when you're meek in love, but it's actually dousing so many things out. And it's it, it, it's building a mountain of love by being meek. And it, it's powerful. Meekness is, is, is true, godly power, I believe. But they, okay. but, but the people without spiritual eyes, they think that you're weak. Without without being meek, you cannot be sacrificial. Without meekness, you cannot be sacrificial. Think hmm. about that for a second. That that's a lot in that statement right there, right? So hmm. uh Romans chapter eight, verses thirty-eight and thirty-nine, very familiar, popular verses. Paul himself pens this down, that this great love of God is unconditional. It's not conditioned on you and I. It's unconditional. Think about that. Right? And then in, in John, the, the great apostle, the, the one that the Lord Jesus loved the most. In John chapter 15, verse 9, John describes and identifies this great love of God as personal. Personal. It's offered to each and every one of us here. It behooves us to embrace that. John chapter 15, verse 9. And everybody here know John chapter 3, verse 16, right? John chapter 3, verse 16. We read this many, many times, but that one statement is full of theology. I challenge you, read that again, meditate again. What John is trying to tell you and I right here is that this agape love of God in John 3, 16 is effectual, effectual, never fails, never fails to do what God sent it to do. Never fail what God allows you and I to experience his love to do. For God so love agapao, the world, that he gave his only begotten son, so that whosoever believes in him shall have life. Here it is, everlasting. Matches the everlasting law, right? The cause and the effect. You cannot have an everlasting law from a source that is not everlasting, can you? <laughs> no. It's simple logic. It's simple no. logic, right? And then it says right here, Twice, did you notice twice the great apostle Paul remind you and I, by grace you have been saved, verse 5, for by grace you have been saved. Then he adds, through faith. Now he elaborated. Here is a mind of the apostle Paul, a glimpse into the mind of the apostle Paul. Yes, he was well first in Greek, but remember, he was a rabbi. Remember, he was a Jew. 
So he is used to this writing in a Hebraic poetic style of repeating the first thought. In this case, the first thought was penned down in verse 5. By grace you have been saved. Then he repeated and elaborated that in verse 8. Through faith, then he explained what he meant by that. Right? So this word grace, charis, unmerited favor. Unmerited favor. If you remember, in the prior chapter, Paul gives us an example of how this unmerited favor of God is un lease and love is upon you and I. He chose us before the foundation of the world. That's grace. He gives us all the spiritual blessing. That's grace. He makes us alive while we were dead in our trespasses. That's grace. And it says right here twice, saved. By grace you have been saved. The word saved right there, so-so. It means to be made whole. To be made wholesome, nothing missing, nothing broken, nothing lacking. That's beautiful promise. That's excellent promise, right? So it involves the grace of God, right? And it involves faith. By the way, this grace of God, according to verse 6, how does this grace of God manifest in you and I? If we live in Christ Jesus, it raised you and us up. What that means is you've died with Christ when you were baptized. Now you've been raised up as he raised Jesus Christ up and seated him in the heavenly places. Notice it says at the end of verse 6, in Christ Jesus. Put it simply, how does this grace of God reach at that? is manifested in your life and my life. When you say, I want Jesus, when you say, I want to be a Christian, when you were baptized to become a follower of Jesus Christ, from that point on, God sees Christ Jesus in you. He no longer see Chris Johnson. He no longer see Stephen McCauley. He no longer see every one of us here. You've been clothed, says the great apostle Paul. Imputed, clothed, imputed. The righteousness of Christ Jesus that Adam and Eve lost in the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. The great exchange, folks. All he asks from you and I is say, I'm sorry for my sin. I'm sorry for allowing myself to be enslaved by the prince of this world. I'm sorry for allowing him to cause me to be so deep brave in the loss of my flesh and in the loss of my mind. I'm sorry for having him deceive me time and time and time again. I'm sorry for being walking dead when you want me to be living stones. So the last thing he says right here in verse 7. So in the ages to come, think about that. Remember I said before, Ephesians is a portal to the past, to the present, into the future. Right here is into the future. In the ages to come that he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us. Is this not why God said himself? It is the kindness of God that leads to repentance. So to answer your question early on, Chris, how do we deal with people who were addicted, in doubt, enslaved, in satanic cults? kindness is this now why the lord jesus said return evil with good good pray for those who persecute you if he asks you to give you your tunic the lord said give the other one too if he tells you to walk one mile walk two miles that's kindness because the kindness of god always leads to repentance always when it didn't the fault is not on God, it's on us. Right. Our motive and intent in doing that kindness may be questionable. That's why at the end of Galatians 5, 22, 23, against such things there is no, no law. Against the fruit of the Spirit, the law of sin cannot penetrate it. You, you doubt, you, it can't, there's no weapon Satan can throw at me if I'm living in the fruit of the Spirit. It, it 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 it's 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 armor love is armor if you are truly born again 
what Paul is saying in Galatians simply is this. You're not living according to the letter of the spirit. You're living according to the spirit of the letter. Mm. Stephen. Ooh. I'm blown away that you just said that uh, kindness um, corrects all repentance or creates all repentance. Like that blows this. me away. Think about this like this, Stephen. This may be prophetic right here. In the next few moments, you and Mimi may be going through a situation that will challenge both your flesh, your all self, your all nature, right? So if you don't allow that all nature, flesh, sark, to rear its ugly head, that's kindness. It's going to lead to repentance. But if you allow that all self to rear its ugly head, that kindness is down the drain. And the two of you are going to argue all the more. Right. I'm telling you, yeah. I'm telling you that this trip alone has been more of that and less of the old. Because yeah. I'm I'm in the passenger seat right now and she's driving and I, I'm not even worried about it. I got full trust in her now. You know, yes. where the old guy would have been watching her she's driving. <laughs> <laughs> not this I hear this word kindness as the as uh, Chris was alluding to. If you read the fruit of the spirit. Kindness is one of those, right? Love, joy, peace, right? And as I said before, there are nine fruits listed under the singular word fruit. The first three, love, joy, and peace, that result from your personal relationship with God. The next three is regarding your relationship with one another. Kindness is one of those. The more kind you are to others, the more through that kindness you're going to lead that person into repentance, whether Christian or not. Yes, 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 yes. Please, folks, stop conditioning our mind to apply the fruit of the Spirit only to the Christians. Mm. You're robbing yourself of producing more fruit exponentially. So, uh, it says right here in first. Hey, for by grace you have been saved, made wholesome through faith. So this offer to enjoy salvation from God, it involves faith. It involves faith. The Greek word pistis, it simply means assurance, persuasion, conviction of truth. Right? This is what makes this biblical God different. You know why? Because he penetrated space and time historically. No other gods have the evidence of their penetration. Huh. This is smoke coming out of your head, Bill. <laughs> this is no. I if if I don't wanna if if I may, I don't want to go on a soapbox, but this is all just it brings me back to my past. And I I I hope I could speak for a few gentlemen with me this evening, where you know but God and God's grace. And he took every single thing away from us because he loved us. Families, jobs, uh, I don't know, you, you name it. The will to live, every single thing was snatched. And he did it because he loved us, you know? And it's, it's, whew. Yeah. The narrative of the fall of Adam and Eve teaches us a few things. Of those things, the most important one is this. In their attempt to be independent of God, they ended up being dependent on God. The idea is, as long as you depend on yourself, God is not in your mind, in your uh, heart, and in amen. your heart. Amen. Oof. I feel blessed that God took that dependence away from me. I feel yeah. lucky. I feel in strengthened that I know I can't do it. I feel, uh, you know, not to be prideful, but it feels like a one-up. Uh, like I could say to him, I, I can't do this. You know, please, guys, don't think you can do it. This is where you need to go. This That's is, you know, wow. your head, your head, you're going to hit a brick wall. You know, and it's, uh, man, it's, it's powerful. It Ephesians, is, it's, I, Ephesians 3 because, is where it comes into play, but wow. 
This is just leading up to it. This is where we are. It's not that we can't. It's the fact that we didn't. (laughs) That's where it came in. And the fact that you look back, it is that. It really takes you back to your knees. It makes you back say, how can you love a sinner like me? How? How? You know, praise, but we can't because of where praise. we are now. But because he did, I can't find enough love in me to give back to him. Like, <laughs> no, it's so it's so deep. It's so it's, hard. From what he saved me from, and and you know, reading this, it's but God, God did it all, yes. he, and he didn't have to, but because he loves me so much, like Bill was saying. And then I just, I just, you know, I look. It's hard for me to express how much I love him these days. I'm not kidding you. Like I, I'll be working all day, and sometimes my back gets, and 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 I'll step on my shoelace and it'll pull it, and and I'm like, I gotta get down there and get it. So, so but um, but 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 you know what I do? I'm like, God, thank you. You know, it was time for me to stretch my back out. Yeah. And I, and he, I I I know he did it. I know he did it. It happened a couple of times today. I'm like, thank you, dear Lord, for 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 giving me this second to stretch my back out. He knows in what all he... things. In all, all things. Yeah. That takes discipline. That takes discipline. Mary Alice. I was gonna say that there's somebody that I've been working with trying to pour more of God into her life. And she she's just in a bad place right now. And the other day, you know, I checked in with her and she said she wasn't doing good because, and I'm reading what she said to me in her, from the phone, it says, I don't feel that he will help me because I believe in the saying, he helps those who help himself. And I, you know, I, I tried to, I just said to her, that's not true. That's, that's not God. That's, and but so this conversation about but God, I I've, I've got to figure out how to bring that into her so that she sees that she doesn't necessarily think he's punishing her. She just feels like he's testing her to see, you, you know, if if she's really in the game. Yeah. So first and foremost, right? What she just said to you right there is not biblical. Mm. Nothing in the Bible tells me what she quoted to you. The reality of our life tells us. It is when we come to the conclusion that we cannot help ourselves. And we admit that. And we embrace that. That God intervened. That's a but God moment. Mm. Wow. Wow. As a matter of fact, Mary Alice... This just came to me right now as I listen to you sharing. This would be my response to her if I were you. I would just simply text her, but God. Let her think it over. Yeah. What are you talking about? What is this? What is this? Right? That's wit right there. Wit. We need that kind of wit in dealing with situations like that, right? So uh, anyway, it says right here, Through faith, that not of yourself. This salvation does not originate in us. This is a truth from the Bible from this verse that every one of us must embrace. Because the moment you think and believe you can save yourself, you've taken Jesus out of the equation. You can no longer claim to be a Christian. Because the word Christian, it's from the word Christ plus the suffix I-A-N. What the word Christian means, I belong to a group, to a club whose leader is Christ. Yeah, I belong to a group, to an organization, to a club whose leader is Christ. That's what the word Christian means. That suffix I-A-N, that's what's implied in the suffix I-A-N. So if you still are dependent on yourself, then you cannot claim to belong to that group whose leader, whose head, according to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22, is Jesus himself, right? Right? The story, the narrative of Adam and Eve is the proof we cannot save ourselves. We 
if we are honest with ourselves, even after we become Christian. Nine out of 10 times, we are troublemakers instead of troubleshooters. Am I right? <laughs> Nine out of 10 times, if we are honest with ourselves on a daily waking moment basis, we are troublemakers instead of troubleshooters. Oh, I speak that for myself. <laughs> this is why as, as much as I try to discipline myself not to talk too much, sometime it is when I had to talk, then I become a troublemaker <laughs> because of the truth that comes out. Not everybody is willing to hear truth these days, right? So anyway, the next thing Paul tells us right here, check this out in verse 8. It is the gift of God. It is the gift of God. That word gift, doron, doron, it means an offering. Think about this like this. God, the Father, is offering the life of his son in exchange for your sins and my sins in exchange of a life without Christ, with a life with Christ, in exchange from being a pauper to a prince. Who is foolish enough not to make that great exchange? Good Lord. It takes a lifetime to wrap my head around that. Yeah. It's going to take a lifetime. Yeah. I mean, think, think, about, <laughs> think about that for a second. All he's telling you and I, this gift. Just take it. I'm offering it to you free of charge, he said. Right? By the way, that word salvation is not just pertaining to you and I being saved from eternal separation from God. The Hebrew word translated into salvation has the connotation you're boxed in in the four walls. No way out. Like you're in a maze. When you find yourself in the maze, the idea of this Hebrew were translated into English as salvation is you have no way out. But here's the analogy. When you find yourself in the maze, when you find yourself boxed in, don't look to your right, to your left, to your front, to your back. Don't look to the ground. Look up. The Hebrew letter Yod is the hand of God dangling in the air, reaching out towards you waiting for you to grab a hold of his hand to pull you out of that box. When you were talking about Peter walking on water and he started drowning, that's what maybe I, I thought that same thing. He looked down yes. instead of looking up. Right. There's so much wisdom in the Bible, folks. I'm telling you. I mean, I just pray to God that every one of us will never lose this hunger and thirst for truth. In God's word, right? Amen. Amen. Because you charge up. I don't care how you came in at six o'clock tonight, but I can tell by your body language, facial expression, there's an energizing going on on the inside of you. Because Jesus Christ Himself said, "My words are spirit and life." Right? Yeah. So, the next thing Paul says right here is nine, verse nine, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast, so that no one may boast. The word works, it simply means deeds, deeds. This is why we as Christians, we are to produce good deeds as the evidence of this pistis faith that Paul talked about in verse 8. By grace, God is unmerited favor. You have been saved, made wholesome through you putting your confidence in the persuasiveness of God's word. But there's got to be evidence of that. If you were a thief, Paul said, stop stealing, get a job. And Paul said, not only do you stop stealing and get a job, share the blessing of their paycheck with somebody else who's in need. That's good deeds, evidence of our faith. You can claim that you no longer are a thief, but if there's no evidence to it, Paul says in Corinthians, you're like a clinging symbol, making a lot of noises. Substance right? You have no substance but form, Stephen. And in the book of James says the same thing. Uh, works without faith is nothing. Yes. Yes. 
And, and can I tell you something? The Hindus, the Buddhists, the Muslims, they cannot prove their good deeds. How so? Great question. How so? Think about this like this. What kind of a person will worship a God that tells them, the more you kill the infidels, the more the reward your Allah is going to give you? Yeah, Is that good true. deeds? Is that good deeds? The good deeds that the Lord Jesus challenges you and I to do are anti-conventional. Return evil with good. Pray for those who persecute you. by your tongue. On the other hand, Islam promotes violence. Is that good deeds? I don't care how holy you are. You could be an imam. The fact that you put your faith in the God that promotes violence. The more the infidels you kill, the more the virgins you're going to receive in heaven. That's not even logical. But, but, but in their mind, that, that is a good deed to them, and it's rewarded. That's because their mind would be praised, like Paul says in the prior verses. They've been deceived, right? Deception. The only antidote to deception is truth. That's it. There's no other way around it, right? So the last thing Paul tells us in verse 10 right here, this offer of salvation from God, if you live your life with Jesus Christ, has a purpose. You're, not, you're no longer living your life purposelessly. It says right here, what is the purpose? For because we are his workmanship. This word workmanship in the Greek, you know how we got this word poem, English word poem? Poema, poema. That's the Greek word translated into English as workmanship. It is from poema that we have this English word poem. So guess what you and I have been created by God to do purposefully? As it regards to this Greek word poema as the connotation of a poem. Research. Is it tell his story? Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. Your life and my life is the love story, lyrics of a song, of a poem, of a poetry God is writing. For this reason, when Paul was challenged by the so-called super apostles in the city of Corinth, Paul did not argue with them. Paul did not get upset. Paul simply told them, you see these Corinthians? He said, these are my episodes. Andre? No, poem is not just any ordinary piece of literature. It is something that reaches our heart. Yes. Poem, right? Poem has a way to get to us on the inside. Poem is very expressive of emotions in the lyric, uh, in the sentences, so to speak, right? So this is what Paul is telling you and I. Life with Christ becomes purposeful and sort of purposeless. And what is the purpose? It says right here, created in Christ Jesus for good deeds, for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. And so many Christians are, feel defeated because they they don't pursue those good works. You know, it's too, it's too, too they're thinking too inward, selfish still, you know. It's that paradigm shift that I'm so thankful for. Don't get me wrong, I think of myself. But uh, a lot less, <laughs> a lot less. And when people are defeated, like Christians are defeated, they think they're just not truly pursuing the 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 the, the good works that God puts right in front of them, but they choose not to, to pursue them because that's what fills me these days. You know, it it's, it has nothing to do with me anymore. It's doing good works for God. I mean, Amen, brother. You yeah, know? yeah, Amen. Yeah. Can I, can I challenge every one of us here to be more prolific when it comes to the fruit of this Holy Spirit in our lives? Every day, you make a promise to God that you're going to produce more of each of the nine fruit. Beginning with tomorrow, help me to produce more love to my wife, to my children, to my neighbor, to my employee, to my coworkers. The next day, help me to produce more joy 
The next day, you fill in the blank. And you rotate that after a cycle of nine days. That's beautiful. It is. But, but I got to be honest with you. I think that's my inward spiritual prayer already. You know, I don't want, you know, do I, I want to love my wife more today. I want to have more patience. So, God, let me go down I-95 to Washington, D.C. with her driving. You know, it, I want that. I, it, it, you know, to say it every morning, I, it's almost in my spirit of one of the things I like to say is I love when Mimi proves me wrong. You know, I just enjoy that. I long for that. And yes, yes, it's worthy of saying every morning, but my spirit longs for that right now. Do you know that sometimes God gives us the answer to our prayer right while we are praying? Uh -huh. Let yeah. me give you an example. Say tomorrow morning, you say grace before the meal. And God impresses into your inner spirit, man, the beggar that you saw last, last week. You know what God is doing right there? He's answering you. your prayer. Hmm. He's telling you. As I bless you with this breakfast, by me impressing upon your inner spirit man that beggar that you came across last week, he's telling you, do it. Do get, do that good deeds now. Don't hmm. argue. Don't reason. Don't justify. I'm not awake yet. I don't have the car. <laughs> You're talking about being totally dependent on the Holy Spirit. Right? The Lord Jesus said, whosoever loses his life for my sake will gain it. It is in moments like that he's teaching you to lose your life for his sake. But if you refuse, you're keeping your life. And the Lord Jesus said, whosoever keep his life will lose it. St. Francis of Assisi came up with such a beautiful prayer. It is in giving that we receive. It is in dying that we truly live. Right? So, uh, the last thing that we're going to unpack right here is this word walk. Walk. Peripateo. Peripateo. It simply means to be occupied with. To be occupied with. It's a fixed way of living. It's a fixed way of living. That is committed to the way of God and the will of God. It's a fixed way of walking, of living, that is focusing on the will and the word of God. So I said before, the Hebrew word translated as walk, right? It's not just a physical walking from one point to point B. It's a righteous walk. What that means is, if you know you shouldn't be going somewhere, don't. Because the moment you go where you know you shouldn't be going, you no longer are walking righteously. You are mm. deviating from that straight and narrow path. And what you're going to do next? Paraptoma. Trespass. Yikes. Yikes. Yeah. Yeah. I, learned, <laughs> I learned from experience on that one. Like go, like driving home and innocently like, oh, I'm going to swing by and say what's up to so-and-so. It was a bad idea. <laughs> I, I knew it was a bad idea, you know? And, and I know I, I had to a, a learn from those speed bumps, but... Yeah, we all do. We all do, right? But uh, to close right here, what kind of walk is Paul telling us? Uh, just to give some example right here. In John chapter 13... John chapter 13, verse 35. I couldn't think of a better source than the disciple whom Jesus loved. In John chapter 13, verse 35, he said, walk in love. Walk in love, right? By the same apostle in chapter 14, chapter 14, verses 15 and 21, 15 and 21, he said, walk in obedience. Walk yeah. in obedience. By the way, in case you don't know by now, that word obedience, there's another Hebrew word. This is how clever and brilliant a biblical God is. Watch this. Obedience. That, that first four letters, obed, 
obed the english word obed the origin of the english word obed is the hebrew word oved o v e d the word oved means a servant so what do you think is implied in the word obedience to be a servant to be a servant a willing obedient servant right so in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, the same apostle tells us, walk in faithfulness. Walk in faithfulness. And to, to, to summarize tonight by Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. Coming from a man with loose mouth, he says, walk in Holiness. <laughs> Coming from a man who denied Jesus three times. He said, walk in holiness. In a separated manner. No longer denying. No longer betraying Jesus. Is this easy to do? No, it's not. For this reason, the, the Ephesians is loaded with this word grace. Garis, garis, garis. And it's loaded with this phrase, in Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus, right? I think tonight the, 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 the main important thing is these two words, but God. Mm. What is it? The situation, the circumstance, the predicament you find yourself in. No matter how seemingly impossible it is, if you would prophetically speak into that situation, but God. Watch how it turns around. Okay? I'm telling you, as many times as I've read the Bible, studied the Bible, every time I sit and prepare, more insights, more revelation, more, you know what I'm saying? Praise God. Yes, yeah. praise God. I hope the preceding video has been a revelation to you of the difference in life with or without Jesus. And I pray that you will make the right decision accordingly. Thank you for watching. See you in the next episode. And God bless.